Right, let me introduce the next speaker. Um, Maya Kohek, if you'd like to come down. Um, Maya works for ICEAS in Netherlands, which is the International Center for Ethnobotanical Education Research and Services. Um, Maya has a PhD in medical anthropology and global health. She researches ritual use of psychoactive plants such as cannabis and ayahuasca, also researching psychedelic circles initiated and led by women. So please give it up for Maya. Hi everyone. Thank you for this uh, nice presentation. Thank you to the organizers for inviting me here. And uh, yeah, as Peter already mentioned, uh, I come from ICERS. Uh, for those who don't know the organization, we do a lot of things. Uh, we try to base our activities and our projects really in communities, different kind of communities also indigenous communities, also Western society, our communities, where we uh, work with, where we also um, um, generate knowledge from. And um, besides uh, educational activities and policy activities and uh, legal advisors, we also support people um, in need uh, uh, that had experiences with plant medicines. And we also do research, which as I said, is focused on what we call real world evidence and in real world practices. So something that uh, other people would call uh, underground practices. Um, those that don't happen in, in laboratories. Although we also did a clinical trial with ibogaine, but that's another topic. So what I came here to talk about is um, Wonderland, País de las Maravillas. Um, it's a community where I uh, did my uh, field work in for my PhD. And um, why did I uh, choose to talk about it? Because um, I think it's a nice example of how psychoactive plants are being used in, in our society that is very much inspired by the different indigenous communities and how they kind of try to bridge or, or reintroduce these kind of practices here. So um, why is it called País de las Maravillas? Well, because they like to make jokes and uh, because they say that we live in a world full of wonders and uh, our role in this world is to take care of everything we see, everything we see. It's not only humans, plants, it's rocks, it's everything has a spirit, everything is alive, and we are here to take care of it all. Um, so, because we are in a, in a wonderful world, they live in wonderland. And um, usually people at the end of the presentation ask me, where is it? So I will already in advance tell you that uh, once you see the white rabbit, you have to follow it, you will find it. So um, this quote was uh, presented here a couple of times already. And uh, actually, I'm not here to talk about how to integrate psychedelic experiences. This example is more about how to integrate psychedelics into the society. So. I'm pretty sure you are all familiar with Huxley's uh, island. Um, he kind of uh, explained there how it could look like to integrate uh, psychedelics in, in society. Uh, the thing is, uh, Pala Island is fiction and Wonderland is reality. Um, So the community was started not with a community in mind. It was started by uh, one woman who um, 
was a, at a point in her life when she had to make a change. She took uh, two of her youngest uh, children. Um, she went to live in a, in a house which was more of a ruin than a house in a mountain in, in Catalonia. And she took uh, three of her friends with her, with their children as well. And um, why did she choose this place? Well, because she was a daimista. She was drinking diamond. And in one of the, the experiences she had uh, was in that mountain. She knew the house existed from before. So... Um, the spirits of the plant told her to go there and under one condition. Um, she has to say yes to anyone who wants to come there and stay there. So she can't reject anyone. This is also how I was able to go there and live with her for a while because she actually couldn't reject me. I didn't know that in, in advance. I realized that later on. Um, so this is also a ph phenomenological community, I call it. It's not that uh, it's a sort of hippie community where people live together. Uh, it's just this house uh, with some other structures around and people come there no, from their houses, which is in the city, in other villages, in other countries even. And they come there for common rituals that, that they do there. Um, when I arrived in, in Catalonia, it was just a few months after the referendum, which you probably heard about. Uh, it was the referendum on the independence of Catalonia, which was in October 2017. I came just after New Year there. And um, all this turbulent... Uh, um, um, political environment was very present, especially in the rural parts of Catalonia. And I mention it because it was also very much reflected in what Wonderland or what the community was doing or how they responded to it. No? So it's not that they are living in a vacuum somewhere in the, forgotten in the mountains, but they are very much responding to what is going on in their surroundings, in the society. And it's also how they respond to it. No? Because um, there was a lot of police violence, there was also a division in society, so their way of responding to it is to do a pilgrimage to Montserrat. Montserrat is a really picturesque, uh, very interesting mountain range in Catalonia. There is a um, monastery there, and in that monastery is the Black Virgin Mary. In the box there, you can go, you can uh, touch the Mary behind glass, but uh, it's there locked up. So their idea was to refer again to the traditions that were done in Spain and in Catalonia, still nowadays, but more in the past, is to take the saints out of the monasteries, out of the churches to the people, so that it gives them hope. So that, uh, uh, no? Uh, they come to people and that the people can can kind of have a bit closer connection to them. So that, their idea was, let's make a pilgrimage to the monastery. Let's demand to take out this wonderful uh, Black Mary with her golden uh, dress. She will illuminate the world She will and she will bring peace to, to not only to Catalonia, to Spain, to the world. They did that several times, it didn't succeed. The, 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 they just didn't want to take her out. Uh, but anyway, that was their uh, way of um, incorporating also the, the Black Virgin Mary into their rituals. There is a song dedicated to her, so they sing it every, every day, <laughs> several times per day. It's a long song. It's in Catalan. Um, and they just sing to her uh, and still pray that she will bring peace to this uh, place. 
Um, so as I mentioned, the, the, the woman that started it all comes from Santo Daime, but uh, actually this place, and she was also traveling a little bit around, but more people travel to this place. So everyone who traveled here brought their practices, brought their knowledge. And uh, in time, it was, um, they created a sort of mix of these traditions. They um, do use daime, ayahuasca, in some of the ceremonies. They do grow their uh, own San Pedro for other ceremonies. They do grow Santa Maria cannabis. Uh, cannabis is particularly important for the community also because for them it's really important that you can have a relationship to the plant that you are practicing in rituals. So ayahuasca is from the jungle, it comes from far away, but um, the San Pedro, they grow themselves, the cannabis is kind of our tradition as well, no? And you can plant the seed in the garden and you take care of the plant and that's where your relationship to that plant starts with planting the seed and then growing it and then uh, sharing it in, in rituals. So they created all sorts of uh, very unique uh, rituals that uh, I believe are practiced only there. And um, that's it. Um, this is the so called uh, Casa de Consejo um, advisory house. This was uh, destroyed by, by a storm, so they, uh, they built another one and they renamed it into the Casa de Conejo, the rabbit house, because again, <laughs> they like humor. And this is just one of the structures where, where they do ceremonies. Um, and the thing, if I, if I relate it now to integration and to what we will also listen tomorrow, I think, is how these experiences are framed uh, in, in Wonderland. So people that come there, these are all people who know each other, they lived they were friends, they were family. Um, so they know who they are, they know where they come from, they know their problems, they know their needs. And um, they don't come to these ceremonies because they have a mental health issue that they want to solve or um, no, any kind of, these kind of problems, but they the the ceremonies are framed in a different context it's more with the perspective of the community so they come together to celebrate it's uh, or they come together to pray for uh, rain because we know that in some parts of spain rain is a bit scarce and it's really an issue so their way of uh, coming together and utilizing or or creating these places where they kind of connect with these plants and practice these rituals like they learned from different communities that they had contact with, no? So instead of asking for, please uh, uh, make me well, please uh, um, cure my disease, it's more, please help us and our community, and not only us humans, but also the plants that surround us and the, the nature that, that we are all part of. Um, and by framing the, the rituals in this community way, also the, the experiences that they have are, are different. So they don't, after the experience after the ceremony, the ritual is over, they don't go to a integration therapist. They have a circulo de palabra the next day, usually. Not necessarily, but most of the time it, it happens. It's done with tobacco. 
So whoever smokes the tobacco has the, the, the power to speak. And uh, if you listen to what they say in these circles, sharing circles, it's, it's usually connected to the community as well. So even if they went through a personal struggle and it was difficult, a difficult experience, what they will point out is that they felt supported by the community. They felt the work that each one of them did to sustain that space. No, so it uh, translates a little bit um, differently the experiences that they have. Plus, for example, uh, the Santa Maria is smoked in the mornings and in the evenings. It's always smoked in group. And when I asked Abuela, the the grandmother, why why is it done like that? Why is it done in the morning and in the evening? She again referred to traditions that farmers had back in the days in, in the country she comes from, which was to wake up in the morning and pray for a good day. So that's what she tries to recreate with the, with the ritual where we share the Santa Maria all together and pray for a good day. And in the evening, we again all come together Stuff has happened during the day. You might even get upset. But in the end of the day, you come together, you share the Santa Maria, you sing together, sometimes you dance together. And this is how also every day these times are created when we all come together, we all share together, and we all experience joy together, usually. Um, they also have an um, educational component to the rituals. So there are some rituals that are just specifically for women. That doesn't mean that men are not involved in the, in the ceremony, because everything is ceremony in the end. If, uh, if, if there is a ceremony that lasts for one week, then everything in that week is a ceremony. The people preparing the food in the kitchen, it's a ceremony, no? They are part of it, it's not excluded from what is happening there. So the ones who prepare the food are doing it consciously with that in mind, that they also prepare the food in the ceremony. And um, in these uh, uh, women's circles, um, men also participate, but they they have certain roles, for example, uh, taking care of the fire for the Temascal or for the sweat lodges. Um, and women have uh, ceremonies where they share among each other. There is um, education <coughs> going on about the female body, about the menstrual cycle, about sexuality. Um, about establishing a different relationship also to your monthly cycles. And uh, it was an interesting story that uh, one of the abuelas said about um, the importance of how we as women uh, perceive our uh, menstruation every month. So the story was that she asked, uh, what are you doing with your blood every month? And then uh, the women said, well, I, you know, I take it out, I throw it in the trash bin, um, I empty it, um, things like that. And then she asked again, what do you do with your power? So this is something that they try to turn around a little bit and, and make women also think differently about who they are. And uh, they created, uh, well, th there is a cherry tree growing in the garden. So they created this uh, nice little uh, um, altar where every month the women can come and uh, uh, give their blood to the tree. Um, 
And this is how they also want to try and make women establish a different connection to themselves, basically. There's the sweat lodge that we do. This is, a, a, um, so the other picture is a, a specific ceremony that is dedicated to, to, the, to cannabis, to Santa Maria. It's called Navegacion Mariana. That I also said already. So I will be moving further. Um, yeah, so if we come back to you no know, integration and to what they are doing, basically, I don't know if that was the reason why why in the beginning this community was started or it was not even started with the mind of I will do a community here but it was just I need this and I need to do this I don't know why let's see what happens so in the in the meantime that was 20 years ago or more uh the this community develops there is yeah, I met in one year of uh, being there several hundred people who come and go. Uh, some are a bit uh, more present in the in the space. You as a yeah as a member of this community, if you feel that you need some distance from your everyday life, if you need if you think you you really need uh, um, to rethink stuff. You can come there, you can come there for a weekend, you can come there for a week, for a month, years, um, and just basically try to figure out what is your next move, what you want to do with your life. So it's, as they also like to joke about, uh, they, they don't refer it, uh, they don't refer to it as a university, but a multiversity where you can learn all sorts of stuff. No, um, also planting salads, working in the field. Uh, you can learn um, from all the people that you meet there about different cultures. You can uh, learn uh, different practices. So they kind of create this, yeah, let's call it a bubble in our society where if you have also no experiences with psychedelics, which they never would call psychedelics, psychedelics, but anyway, um, where you are not considered weird for having these uh, experiences, but normal, and where uh, you have this community that supports you, no, and that uh, that if in case you need any kind of help you always know that uh, they will get your back, basically. And as uh, Abuela says, usually that uh, the future of human society is in small tribes. So we have to organize in small tribes. We have to work together. We have to form this community so we can basically address all these great issues that we in the Western society are facing, such as great disparities between people, um, such as rising loneliness, which some call even an epidemic, uh, mental health problems that are also quite uh, present in our society. So this is kind of their way of addressing it. And uh, for them, the, the main answer to address all these problems is community, no? And this is what they try to do. But of course, this is just one example and uh, ah, five minutes, okay, I have still some time. Uh, this is just one one example and it's more uh, an exemption than a rule. So in, in ISERS, we also have a support center as I mentioned in the beginning. And the support center uh, tries to address other problems that we see in, in this area, which is that people do have problems in 
dealing with the experiences that they have had, no? So we have this um, support center, which now we call uh, Lighthouse El Faro, where people can uh, contact us with any kind of problem or question, and uh, we try to help them out as good as we can. And uh, I think we got several thousand people contacting us in the last yeah, 10 years that, that this service exists. The organization itself is celebrates this year 15 years. Mm. And uh, since uh, end of 2022, we also have a form that you have to fill out. So you have to say what kind of issues you really have. Uh, so we know already to prepare well uh, when when you have a appointment with a with a therapist. So we did a quick uh, view on what kind of data we actually get or uh, why people contact us. And of course, the majority is either in acute crisis and need some help, or had the experience and needs some sort of support with um, with what we call integration. And there is a smaller percentage of people who are thinking about taking psychedelics. And it's usually people who heard somewhere in the media or from a friend that uh, for their mental health condition, it would be good. So they are puzzled by, oh, should I do it? And is it safe? So that's mainly the reasons why they contact us and mainly the also the countries where, where the people come from that contact us. It's also, uh, yeah, men and women, the, a bit more women than men. It's uh, kind of uh, uh, around 40 years old, so also not that young. Uh, the majority is not in psychiatric treatment or uh, also receives uh, psychotherapy. So, I mean, they, they are not really uh, mental health patients, let's say. Uh, the majority of people contact us because of ayahuasca related ceremonies. That doesn't want to say that ayahuasca is the main issue, but it's just that also our organization works mainly in ayahuasca. That's what people know us from, I think. So, um, but these are kind of also the other substances that, that they uh, take and experience problems with. And um, what was interesting when you go and read those short statements uh, where they explain what's wrong, uh, there are some specifics, which is the, the majority of people has issues with anxiety. So extreme fear and just feelings that, that they can't function in a normal day-to-day -day, uh, life. So they really need some sort of support. Um, it's not only people who went uh, for a retreat in Peru a week ago and come back home and now there is a problem, but it's also people and quite a lot of them who took a psychedelic 10 years ago and they still struggle with it nowadays and it's still affecting their day, day to day. Um, that was surprising for me um, that they actually need so much time to come to and be able to talk to someone who can understand them. And uh, people experience different kinds of things. So we try, we try to kind of put it in three categories. One is physical effects. So really, yeah, headaches or something uh, very physical. Mm, then it's anxiety, psychological uh, problems. And then there is something that uh, we still struggle of how to call it. But it has a bit different flavor to it. You can't just simply put it in, oh, that's a psychological uh, effect, but they are talking about entities, they are talking about feeling possessed or other kind of energies. And uh, our therapists try to keep an open mind with all of these people. And if they feel that they really can't help them anymore, then we tend to refer them to other curanderos and people who are trained in these other kind of experiences uh, and 
possibly help them with that. And with that, I want to just uh, close it off. There is still another one, which is the integration course that we are doing, a quick commercial, and that's it.